Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the good news you have given to us to benefit by as well as to proclaim. Whereas that tonight as we go through these verses of the proclamation of the gospel, you'll give us the vision to be able to give this same gospel to people around us in Jesus' name. Amen. We're asking that tonight you'll draw every one of us to yourself in Jesus' name. Amen. As we see what we're reading today, and the Holy Ghost takes the scriptures to interpret unto us, we pray that you'll make us to see your mercy and your grace and your love very clearly in Jesus' name. For those of us who are born again, who are saved, help us to understand the salvation more. And for those who are yet to enter into the kingdom, show them that you are expecting them. In Jesus' name we pray. We're reading the first few verses of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. And as we look into these verses, we come across a man who went so far away from God. But the further he went, the more evil he did, the more the compassion and the love and the mercy and the grace of God sought after him. And the account we're reading up tonight is the account of that great event when Jesus Christ met the soul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. And it was an event that changed the life of Saul as well as turned around the history of the church. It was a unique event, a unique experience, a unique conversion that came to this unique man because God just took the worst person that ever lived at that time and made him the best anyone could ever wish to be. Before that time, he was a scholar of the Old Testament, and he was taught by Gamaliel. Later, he was the leader of the persecution movement. He was the leader of the people that were persecuting the believers. But the Lord met with him, and a great change came upon his life. There are so many things to learn from this great event. But the most spectacular one might be for us that no matter how far a sinner has gone in sin, the grace of God covers all that he might have done. If we only turn around and see and receive that mercy and the love of God. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, we're reading from verse 1. And so yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around him, about him, a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to creak against the priests. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him on into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. In the passage we've seen this great character. We're told in verse 1 that he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter. The environment in which he lived was that of hatred and bitterness, persecution and cruelty. 
He was a very dangerous man, dangerous to the people that were calling on the name of the Lord. But then as he was going on his way to Damascus, wanting to go and arrest whichever disciples he will find in Damascus, an event happened. A miraculous thing occurred on the way to Damascus. He heard a sound. The lightning came upon him. He saw a great light. He fell to the ground. And the voice of the person talking said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Surprised as he was and dazed as he was, confused as he was, he managed to ask a question, Lord, who are you? And then the Lord spoke and he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Don't you find it hard kicking against the pricks, against the goats? And he trembling and astonished, surprised and taken aback, asked a question, what will I do now? I've gone so far. I've spent my life in this way. Any hope? What will I do? And the Lord told him to arise and go into that city. And there he will be told what he will do because a commission was coming his way. There were men that were going with him. Those men stood speechless. They were hearing a voice. They were hearing what was being said. But they couldn't really understand the meaning, the significance of the message. They saw no man. And Saul arose and he went to Damascus. Entering into Damascus, he entered into a time of praying, seeking the face of the Lord. Just three things I want you to notice in the passage. One, the vice, the evil he did. Two, the vision that he saw. Because, you know, this was a vicious man, a very terrible man. And the vice of his life was terrible. But then as he was going, there was a vision that he saw. But it wasn't just the vision, the voice that turned his life around. Or you put it another way, number one, you see his cruelty. Because the Bible says he was breathing out with threatening and with slaughter. It was very cruel. Or you see the crime of this vicious man. And then as the Lord met him and he stood trembling and astonished, you see the conviction that came upon that man. And in fact, at last, he became converted. You see the conversion. Now, let's see. I've told you that this event was momentous and great for the church and for Saul himself. But all you want to see here is not just the cruelty of the man, not just the conviction of the man, not just the conversion of the man. You want to see the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God that will not allow a man like this to perish. You know, sometimes you see a man and you say, how wicked this man is, how cruel this man is, how terrible, how sinful. And then sometimes you don't even need to, you don't even want to talk to that individual to invite him to taste of the mercy of God because you say he has gone so far into evil. But when you look at this event we're studying tonight, you know that the grace of God covers that individual. You know there are times that the devil will like to deceive some of us. And uh, you might have gone so far and you are just desiring to come to the Lord, you want to pray, you want to seek for the mercy of God, and that old devil will want to deceive you and will tell you, don't you think you've gone so far, you've done so much evil, that it will be impossible for the Lord to show mercy unto you? It's a lie. You stand shoulder to shoulder to Saul and see who was more cruel, more difficult, more evil. And you'll see that Saul of Tarsus had no parallel. He was terribly evil. But you know, if there was grace available for him, there is grace available for you. Now let's see the cruelty of this wicked man. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings, and slaughter. Now, that verse is saying in the original Greek that the very air that he breathed was an air of murder. The thought of his life, the ambition of his life, the goal of his life was just to kill, kill the believers. He was bloodthirsty. The consuming passion of Saul's very existence, his life goal and ambition was to persecute and destroy the disciples wherever he saw them. 
be it in Jerusalem or Damascus or in the regions beyond, he was looking for them. And we're told that he made a great havoc of the church in Jerusalem. We're told in this verse 1, Saul, breathing out the hot air, the murderous air of threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and he desired permit letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. This career of persecution he had started before this time. Do you remember when, when Stephen was being stoned to death? Saul was there. We're told in chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, reading from verse 58. And he cast him out of the city, talking about Stephen, when he was persecuted, and he stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. He had started that career long before this time. In chapter 8, verse 1, And Saul was consenting unto his death. That means he gave his authority into it. He gave his voice into it. He sanctioned it. And he even instigated the people and, and collected them around and said, Oh yes, it must be done. Kill him all. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And in verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. How did he do it? That was his full-time work because he entered into every house, every house. And hailing men and women, committed them to prison. You know, everywhere he went, when he heard the language of the, from the mouth of the people, as he saw them, he knew these were Christians. Their comportment, their character, their message, their conversation marked them out as believers. And he could identify them. He knew their lives. He knew the way they lived. And he knew the people they were living with. He knew they were living together. And he entered into every house. And as he saw them, he just hauled them into prison. And it made no difference whether they were men or women. He committed them to prison. Can you imagine a man like this? Separating the mothers from their children because those mothers were Christians. And while the children were crying, he neglected all those tears and all those cries. He just made that woman to go into the prison because the woman was calling on the name of Jesus. And while he was taking the husband away, the man away, the wife crying and weeping, saying that is the breadwinner of the house, of the home, of the family. Why not Saul just spare this man to take care of the family? And he regarded nobody. He regarded not even the cries of the woman or the cries of the children. He just took these people and he put them into prison because of no other, no other offense except they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He counted it heresy that they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He felt Jesus Christ died. But these believers were going all about to say that Jesus rose from the dead. He couldn't take it. He thought they were speaking blasphemy. He thought their way of religion was heresy. And he felt that they were not doing right in saying that Moses uh, wasn't the person they wanted to listen to. They wanted to listen to Jesus because he had come with grace and with the gospel, with faith and with the mercy of God. And that if they believed on him, that was enough. Without the killing of animals, without the killing of rams, that they will be saved. To Saul, it was heresy. And he saw their lifestyle. He saw they will go in love how they will go in faith. He saw that the emphasis was on the mercy of God, on the grace of God. He saw that the emphasis was faith in the name of the Lord. Through that name, they said they were saved because they said there was no other name given among men, whether in heaven or on earth, whereby they must be saved except by the name of this Jesus. And Saul hated that name. He hated the emphasis on faith in the name of Jesus for healing, for, uh, for salvation, for deliverance, for everything virtually in their lives. And because of that, he just got them into prison. Later when he himself was talking about it, 
He said in Acts chapter 22, reading from, from verse 3, I am very lay man, which I am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in, Cil in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. <clears throat> now you need to understand the background of the life of this Saul so that you will know why he was so proud, why he was so sure he was doing right, yet he was such a wicked, cruel individual. He was born in Tarsus. Now Tarsus was a great city in those days because it was one of the cities that had the great university. There was one university in Tarsus, another in Athens, another in Alexandria. And those three universities were just great universities, academic center. And he had been trained, well trained. Sorry, in Cilicia. And he had, he had been trained under Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was a single individual that was respected in the whole of the land of Israel. You know, they called him the beauty of the law. The whole, the real wisdom of the law. You know what they said when Gamaliel died? They said the law has perished. Because there was no expounder. There was nobody to teach them the law as Gamaliel did. And this man was taught by Gamaliel. Apart from it, that he, he belonged into a particular city, which had the privilege of hosting a great university. Apart from the fact that he was taught by Gamaliel. Apart from all those facts, he was a Jew, he was a Pharisee. Not only that, he even had Roman citizenship. And that was a great thing in those days. And he was zealous toward God. Zealous toward God. Uh, you know that in those days, before, when you were a scholar, under such a great man as Gamaliel, there were large portions of the Old Testament to just cram. You'll just be reciting the portions of the Old Testament by, uh, from memory. And he thought he was just on his way to heaven. Look at verse 4. And I persecuted this way unto death, binding and delivering into the prisons both men and women. He told you he did not respect, you know, the frailty of the women. He didn't, he didn't bother himself about whether those men and women were weaker vessels or not. He handled them the same way. Both men and women, he threw them into the prison. As also the high priest does bear me witness. And all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters, permit, unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. Look at what he said in chapter 26, Acts 26, from verse 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, that's the name he hated, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints, men and women, did I shut up in prison, having received authority, permit, or letters from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. I witnessed against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad and furious and angry, Against them, I persecuted them even unto foreign cities, strange cities. Even when they ran away from Jerusalem, when they were driven away because of the persecution, I got information about where they have gone and I went there to persecute them. Not only in Damascus, even unto strange cities, different places, he was seeking after them. But you know, while he talked about this, he never forgot the mercy of God. My brother, my sister, don't capitalize on your past sin. Capitalize on the grace of God. And you know, if you think about what you've done in the past, what you were in the past, the only conclusion you'll be able to make is that you were so bad, and you will think that you were so bad, you were so evil, you were so sinful, that uh, would you be able to make it to heaven? Don't capitalize on darkness. Those who are days of darkness, Capitalize on light. Come into the light. Don't capitalize on your evil. 
Don't put the emphasis on your cruelty of the past. Put the emphasis on Calvary, on the blood of Jesus, on the mercy of God, on the grace that is able to bring you nearer to himself. That's what Paul said. You know anybody that lived like Paul? Cruel, bitter, very mischievous and very wicked. Even after such people have come to the Lord and they have been saved, if they are not concentrating on the grace of God and the mercy of God, they live miserable lives all through their lifetime because they'll be thinking, oh, I was so bad, I was so bad. And so think about how, how bad you were. Think about how good God is. As you think about how deep you are in sin, think of how deep the grace of God is. As you think of how high you are in crime, think about how high the mercy of God has been. That's the balance. That's the thing that kept Paul the apostle. When he became Paul the apostle, that's the thing that kept him going all through his life. You know, the devil would like, to just, would like you to just uh, be in the dungeon, in despair, in discouragement, and say, oh, I was so bad. Maybe God will punish me for what I did before. And because I was so bad, maybe I will never get my prayer answered. Maybe I will never amount to anything. Maybe I will never do good. No, Paul did not think like that. Now come to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. Who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was before... You see that? Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was, ab was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying. And what the of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And how bad are you? Will he save you? Well, I am the chief among all those sinners. If he has saved me, he will save you. That's what Paul was saying. So Paul the apostle was saying, if you ever feel bad about your sin, think about me. If you ever feel you are, so, you are so wicked, you are so bad, a blasphemer, a persecutor, an injurious person, think about me. If you ever felt you have done wickedly and you have not been innocent, you have not been righteous, and you ever felt, will God ever receive me, think about Saul. He said, this is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Real sinners. Now, Jesus doesn't save those who are not real sinners. And if you're a sinner, you qualify for his salvation. You qualify for his mercy. And you know, there are people that like to save themselves. They want to become better before they come to Jesus. They don't know Jesus. They feel, well, I'm so bad that Jesus will not receive me. You miss the point. You don't take a vehicle that is not bad to the mechanic if your vehicle is working right, if the engine is all right, and if the body is all right. You don't take it to the mechanic. But you know, if that vehicle is bad, very bad, and it's getting to pieces, falling apart, that's when you take it to the mechanic. And when the, when the problem in the vehicle is small, you take it to a small mechanic. An inexperienced mechanic because that's uh, something he can do. But when that accident has been so bad and that vehicle has been so wrecked and it is almost, uh, you know, a write-off that you think that uh, nobody will be able to do this, then you take it to the specialist. And you say, now I have brought it. You don't take it to the specialist if the problem is minor. And if your sin is minor, you don't think you need Jesus Christ. But if that sin is so heavy and so weighty and those sins are so bad and you have been so cruel and you have been a blasphemer, a persecutor, an injurious person and you have been a prostitute and you have been a wicked individual, a robber or you, you've done things that people here and they shake their head and you're a real sinner, then you ought to come to the mechanic. You ought to come to Jesus Christ. You ought to come to the person that says... I just specialize in forgiving sinners that are really sinners. And so you see, the grace of God is so wonderful. Now come back to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, verse 1. 
and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he formed any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. My brother, my sister, I want you to see something here that is deep, deeper than our intelligence, deeper than our mind, deeper than our understanding. And please, when you see the grace of God, you just bow before God and you worship and you say, God, mysterious are your ways. Now listen to me. This man left Jerusalem. Listen very well now. As this man left Jerusalem, he was going to Damascus. Everybody knew why he was going to Damascus. He wanted to go and do evil. He wanted to go and persecute the Christians again. And now, he met the Lord on the way. As he met the Lord on the way, I'm going to ask you a question. Which ought to set you thinking and which ought to change your life and change your attitude towards people? Suppose this man, after he met Jesus Christ, saw the lightning, heard the voice, and, and answered the Lord, and now yielded totally to the Lord. Suppose before he entered Damascus, he died. What will everybody in Jerusalem church think about? He went to hell. What will everybody in Damascus think about? He went to hell. Where will the burial be done? Well, the burial will be done in the synagogue by the high priest and by the priests that were there in those synagogues. And every Christian on the face of the earth will be sure that man went to hell. But everybody will be wrong because that man met Jesus on the way to Damascus. You, you are not sure where people go when they die? You are not sure if they met the Lord in that hospital? You are not sure if they met the Lord on the way to Damascus. You are not sure if they met the Lord even while they were going on a journey to do evil. You are not sure what happened between them and the Lord before they eventually closed their eyes in death. My brother, my sister, never comment negatively on the death of anybody that dies. Never. Never. Somebody who has been a wicked sinner, a terrible sinner, never comment on where has he gone. You don't know. Only God knows. So you see this Saul of Tarsus, as he was going, he met the Lord. But you know, before we go into the conviction part of it, just these two verses. Now, never be discouraged. If you have been praying for somebody, I'm asking you a question now. Suppose you are a believer in Jerusalem, and um, you've been praying, night vigil, you've been praying, uh, you know, during the prayer meeting, and with all the believers, and uh, uh, somebody came with information. And, uh, you know, we've been rejoicing in our, in our fellowship, in our prayer meeting. We have been saying, oh, thank God you have answered us. Thank God you have got that man. Thank God you are going to save him. And now somebody came to you and said, I had information. This one, is, I got it from a source. That source is so sure. That Saul has gone with a band of men. He has gone to Damascus. What has he gone to do? He has got a letter from the high priest. And it's already, in fact, when he was going, somebody who saw him, he said his eyes were red. And he was bragging and he was saying, I am going to crush the church in, in Damascus. I'm going to destroy all of them. Now, you were part of the praying team. How would you respond? You will go back on your praying. You will say, oh God, we thought you answered our prayers. When are you going to answer? And then you will start praying again. Didn't God say, if two of you shall agree as touching anything that you ask on earth, it shall be done for you of my Father which is in heaven? Didn't he say, if you will only believe, this mountain will be removed? Didn't he say, if you believe all things are possible? Oh yes, some people might have been praying for Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And when they had this information, it was on his way to Damascus, they became discouraged. Where is your faith? You've been praying for your husband. And you know when you are just rejoicing with your prayer partner that, oh yes, my husband is coming to the Lord, you just saw him again and he came in with another lady, another terrible woman. And oh, you say, I thought God answered my prayer. But didn't God answer your prayer? 
Are you walking by sight? Don't you know anything can, ha can happen between Jerusalem and Damascus? Look out to the hills where your help comes. And don't look and don't walk by sight. If God said he has answered, no matter what you see of Saul of Tarsus, and no matter what you see of your husband, God is catching that man. And when he gets to Damascus, you will hear a testimony. And you know, as they were going, we're told in verse 2, he desired of him letters of the high priest, letters to Damascus, to the synagogues. Now, listen to me. When the church started in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, you remember? In the, in the upper chamber, in the upper room. Those people did not separate themselves from the synagogues. They were mixed up with the various synagogues in the land. You know, when that miracle took, uh, took place in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, the people, it was in the, in, in, uh, in the synagogue. Because, you know, in that temple, Peter and John were going to pray in, in the hour of prayer. What I'm saying is that they didn't have a separate church. A separate church. They were just like, uh, they were just worshipping in all the synagogues, the denominations. And you know that in Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, it was the same thing. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 5, when the angel came and he told Peter, you go back into that same temple and speak to them the word of life. It was with the sinners that were worshipping in those synagogues. Yet they were believers. And you know, it went on like that. And in this place again, we're told that Saul was going. He knew where to find the Christians, where to find the disciples, because, you know, they had not separated themselves as a denomination. They had not separated themselves from the various synagogues. You remember when in this church, we were mixed together with all those synagogues and temples in town? Oh, yes, we were Christians at that time. You know, the time came when the Spirit of the Lord led that the church should not totally separate from these people. And before you got to the end of Acts of the Apostles, they had their separate meetings and they had their separate places. And it is the same thing today. We started that same way, according to the pattern of Acts of the Apostles, that when we started in this work, in this church, we were mixed together with all those synagogues and all those temples and all those tabernacles and all those denominations. But then we were Christians and we were carrying on the work. And at that time, the church was growing. And uh, those who, who wanted to persecute us, they knew the places they will find us out. And when they got to those places, they knew by the dressing, by the language, by the testimony, by the restitution, they knew that those were the people and we were easy to persecute. But you know, the Lord led us that now we will have this church. Not that we don't have interest in those denominations that are still outside there to help them. We still have that desire and that love to help them. But now the Lord has led us as he led the early church. Now it said in verse 2 that he found any of this way. That's what they call Christianity at that time. This way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he called all his followers, those who are following this way. Well, is the way of peace, is the only way to God, and he's the one that described the narrow way that goes to heaven, and so you called all his disciples, the people that were following this way, and he said if he found a man or a woman following after that way, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. That was the cruelty of this man. Now, did you know this? That Damascus was such a beautiful city, an ancient city. As you read your Bible very well in Genesis, you'll find that one of the servants of Abraham came from Damascus. That city had been there for a long, long time. And by that time, it was a beautiful city. Just wonderful. Just wonderful. And uh, if you were going from Jerusalem to Damascus, about a distance of 160 miles to 200 miles, it took you even by caravan because, you know, in those caravans, there will be men that will, ca that will carry those caravans. Because a serious Jew, like a Saul was, will not travel on the horse, but he will travel with those uh, caravans and some of them will walk. It will take them six days and, you know, they will pass through Samaria. Now listen to me. Saul, the wicked... You'll be surprised he respected the law of the land so much. He found Christians in Samaria because going from Jerusalem to Damascus, there was no way he could do it. He must pass through Samaria. You remember Samaria where Philip had been and there was a great revival in Acts of the Apostles chapter 8? 
and many many people in that whole city they just uh, had a wonderful revival and many people were converted you ask the question why didn't he branch in um, Samaria and destroy the Christians there number one he didn't have the permit to get into any synagogue there and that man even though he was wicked he was a law-abiding person and he said well <laughs> I didn't know these Christians were so many in this place, but I don't have a permit. I don't have a letter to branch in this place and, and confuse them. I think I better go where I am going. Even in his persecution, you can see that this man was a man of purpose. He wanted to go to Damascus, and even though he saw something, a side issue, a side attraction in Samaria, he didn't branch there. Christians, we need that purpose in our lives. That if you are purposing to go and do something for the name of the Lord, for the glory of God, not persecution now, but you are doing something that will be for the growth of the church, for the benefit of people. If you were going to Damascus before and you saw a side issue, a side effect in Samaria, go on, go on, keep moving. Now what's your life? What does God want you to be? A preacher? And then you see a side attraction, move on, move on, don't branch in Samaria. If you have a commission within your heart, if you have a vision that is driving you, if you have a purpose in your life, and you know that there is a place the Lord is leading you, you may see many things by the wayside. Don't branch aside. Just go on in the thing that you know, that you know the Lord actually wants you to do. And he went. It will take him six days to go from Jerusalem to Damascus. But before he got there, something happened. Look at verse 3. Acts chapter 9, verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Let's stop there. How soon do you think God will answer prayer? I want you to picture all these Christians in Damascus. And I want you to picture these spiritual Christians and with spiritual gifts in Damascus who are believers. They have been having their prayer meeting. And, uh, you know, when, when Saul left uh, Jerusalem, they were having their prayer meeting, and somebody that had the gift of the Holy Ghost just broke out in prophecy, in tongues and interpretation, and said, oh, Saul of Tarsus is coming to Damascus, and he's, he wants to come and destroy the people, the Christians in Damascus. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? That is prophecy. That is revelation. <laughs> but you better look at the promises of God together with that prophecy. And you know some Christians already will be packing their load. They will be saying, well, I don't want to die now. I just want to take care of my children. And they will waste money and run away from Damascus. They don't know that Jesus has answered their prayer. And you know, while they prayed and they told the Lord, Oh Lord, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? The man was driving furiously coming from Jerusalem. He was going to destroy the people. My brother, my sister, this is why we learn from the Bible. We are not just reading verses 1 to 9, just read it and say, well, praise the Lord as, uh, as it was, so shall it be, so it is, and so shall it be. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now stand up and read the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, and then uh, glory, everything. Amen. And then we go back home. From where are you coming? We went for Bible study. That's not Bible study, that's Bible society. But you know why we're studying the Bible is that we'll be able to apply these things to our life. You know they were praying in Damascus. You know they must have been praying because this man was coming. He wanted to destroy them. My brother, no matter how near that doom, that difficulty may be, Jesus will cross that person on the way. You know, it may, it may seem near. We are told in verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Those weak believers in Damascus, their knees were knocking together now. Oh, we have had information. He is very near now. Oh, Lord, if I die tonight, have mercy on my soul. I don't know when I'm going to die. Maybe it is today, maybe it is tomorrow, because I hear that Saul is very near. Think about life, not about death. Think about light, not about darkness. Think about grace. And not about evil. Think about the power of God. And not about the power of the persecutor. As it was near suddenly. There shined round about him. A light from heaven. I'm happy to announce to you. 
that God in a supernatural way, mysterious way, is going to arrest all your enemies in the name of Jesus. I didn't say he's going to kill them. I didn't say he's going to throw them to hell. I said he's going to arrest them in the name of Jesus. You, you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear. All things in heaven, on earth, they are under the control of the Almighty God. Why are you afraid? As if Saul is coming and Saul is going to destroy everybody in the church. Oh no, oh no. Jesus is still on the throne. And now comes the conviction of this man Saul. And we're told suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth. A great man, he fell to the earth. A powerful, courageous man, he fell to the earth. A man that ne never wept in his life because he saw those Christians being stoned, he never wept. He did not have anything you call mercy. He did not have anything you call sympathy. He was so wicked, he was so brutal, he was so cruel, he did not regard anybody. If the women were crying, that was not his business. But he fell to the earth. Oh, the power of the Almighty God. God your own father. Now you know anytime you are likely to be afraid, anytime something is happening either in your home, in your family, or your place of work and there is fear in your heart, think about this God who is sitting on the throne and while Saul of Tarsus was getting the letters, he didn't stop him. He could, he didn't. When he got all his band together, and they were starting the journey and they were saying now this is your duty when we get to damascus this is what you will do when we get to damascus this is what you do and they appointed all they gave all the job description god was just looking at him and as he was going and planning when i get i get to that synagogue downtown i'm going to lock all of those people up when i get to that other synagogue in the upper side of the of the town i'm going to lock all of them up as he was planning god was just looking at him and then he took his journey 10 miles, 20 miles, 50 miles, 100 miles, 150 miles. Now he was very near and heaven arrested him. Our God is wonderful. And to think that this God is your father. And that he has promised he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. This story makes us to believe that power belongs to him. And we're told that he fell to the earth and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Think about it. Think about it. Why persecutest thou me? Was he persecuting Jesus or the believers? He was persecuting the believers. But you know... The body and the head, they are the same. What hits me, hits Christ. What hits you, hits the Lord. You know what the Bible says in Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 8? You need this verse. Zechariah chapter 2 verse 8. Zechariah is uh, second to the last in the Old Testament. Chapter 2 verse 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after the glory as he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that toucheth you, toucheth the apple of his eye. You see that? You are a believer, you are a child of God. Anybody that tries to touch you, touches the apple of the eye of the almighty God. And so Jesus said, why persecutest thou me? You know the surprising thing? Saul believed that Jesus Christ was dead. He didn't believe all the story of the resurrection. He didn't believe all the testimony of the resurrection. And now this uh, person said, Why persecutest thou me? Well, he knew there was God in heaven. He knew God could be talking. He knew there were angels in heaven. He knew an angel must be talking, could be talking. But then he said, Who art thou, Lord? This person talking must be God. It couldn't be Stephen that uh, was stoned to death. It must be the Lord. And the Lord said, I am Jesus. 
Did he believe the resurrection now? Of course he did. He didn't believe before. He didn't believe before. He said no. He even thought it uh, something incredible that somebody would rise from the dead. Because he persecuted them. Because he, he thought it was heresy. He thought it was blasphemy. Now, he thought that it was blasphemy to say that Jesus rose from the dead. But now that Jesus that is alive, who he knew was dead before he said, I am Jesus, that was enough. That was a blow to all his ideas. He now knew that Jesus rose from the dead because this Jesus was now talking is alive. Not only that, he knew this Jesus was, the, was this very God of very God and very man of very man. Because he said, who art thou, Lord? You know, immediately he became convicted of all his own errors. And because Jesus said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now the pricks in those days, actually the goat, it was a long stick with a sharp metal at the end of it. And when you are driving an ox to go somewhere, if the ox is rebellious or stubborn and will not move, you just a pinch or chew uh, the, the ox with uh, the tip of that metal at the end of the rod. And if the ox will just kick back, it will be kicking at the metal. It will not hurt the rod or the metal. It will not hurt the pricks or the goat. It will hurt itself. And so Jesus was saying, Saul, are you hurting God? Can you hurt God? All this bitterness and fury and anger. Are you doing anything against God? Have you forgotten Pharaoh? Did, could he do anything against God? Haven't you studied your Old Testament? Have you forgotten Goliath? Could he do anything against God? Haven't you studied your Old Testament? Did you remember Nebuchadnezzar? Could he do anything against God? Have you not studied Belshazzar? Did he do anything against God? Are you not hurting yourself? It is hard for you. You are having a hard time. Kicking against the priest. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I surrender. That's conviction. He was convicted. Now my brother, my sister, let me help you. Sometimes you preach salvation message. And when you preach salvation message, you're unhappy with yourself. You said, well... I have not uh, outlined all their sins before them. I have not told the men and the women, Oh, you have committed adultery, you have committed fornication, you have robbed, uh, you, are, you are a tale-bearer, uh, you are evil, you have told lies, and you give a list of 100 sins so that the people will be convicted. You know, Jesus did not say now, Saul, let me talk to you about yourself. You are so bad, you have hatred, you have bitterness, and you are threatening and you're a murderer, and you're just a deceiver, and you're a religious fellow, and you're shallow, and you're a hypocrite, and you're a Pharisee, just line everything up. Jesus didn't need to say all that. You know, he just said, you're persecuting me. Think about that. A short message. But think about it. Did he need any other message? He had a long message from Stephen. He was there when Stephen was preaching. And all those other men and women that was casting into prison, he had heard their testimonies. He had heard of the gospel. And he had heard so much, but he hadn't decided. And now he didn't need to hear a long, long, long message talking about sin, talking about uh, redemption, talking about Adam and Eve, talking about uh, the Old Testament, and talking about uh, Isaiah chapter 53, and talking about all that the prophets have said, and talking about, you know, all his wayward ways, and talking about, you know, all the sins he was committing. Oh no, it is a hard thing for you to kick against the priests. Why are you persecuting me? And you know what he said? What will I do? What do you want me to do? Anything. You want me to turn away from all my past life? I'm ready. You want me to just give my life to you right now and begin to serve you? I am ready. And he was saying, if it's repentance, if it's restitution, if it's commitment, if it is working for you, anything, I just surrender. Now, listen to me. Jesus did not require him to remember all the sins he committed since he was born. He couldn't do that. You can't remember all that. Don't wait uh, before you get saved and say, well, I'm trying to get saved. Why are you not saying, oh, I want to be saved. I want to give my life to the Lord. But you know, I have committed 72 sins. But uh, there is an idea, there is a thought in my heart that these sins, they remain. But uh, I can't remember them. 
and I'm trying and I'm telling the Holy Ghost remind me of all my sins oh yes I remember one now I committed another one in the secondary school oh God I remember that one I will not do that anymore but I still have this nagging doubt within me there must be another sin I'm still forgetting you know if you continue like that you may never be saved you know Paul did not have all that recollective memory to be able to remember everything just sorry enough to say Lord I'm turning around I've served the devil I've served myself and I've served the dead religion but now I come to you what will I do what do you want me to do I'm ready for anything now you know that is all that God requires my brother my sister restitution is important but listen to me you know if you are not studying the Bible sometimes when you hear the pastor preach You'll say, ah, are they going against all the doctrines we knew before? No, we're not changing the Bible. The Bible is right here. Listen to me. This man met Jesus Christ on the way. And then when he got to Damascus, he logged himself up. And uh, he was praying. Because the Bible says so that he was praying. I'll read it to you just now. And then Ananias came to him. You know what Ananias said? Ananias said, brother Saul. What does that mean? He was born again. He was converted. Listen to me. He was there when they were killing Stephen. I don't know whether the mother of Stephen was still alive. And uh, Jesus didn't say, before you get saved, before you become a brother, you go and find out the mother of Stephen and apologize to him that you are the person carrying their clothes before he died. You know, if you had to go all through the various countries, so we find finding out the mother of Saul, the mother of Stephen somewhere. The salvation may be delayed. And you know all the people he gathered into prison? <laughs> he didn't even know where they were now. Listen to me. All those people, he went from house to house, from house to house, from house to house in Jerusalem. And now they were all scattered. They didn't leave their address behind in Jerusalem. Some of those people, they were scattered into, you know, areas of Judea, areas of Samaria and, Sil and uh, Cyrene, all over. They just scattered. And if Jesus said, now Saul... <laughs> To get saved, you have a hard time. All those people you threw inside prison, begin to search for them. God is not man. If God wants to save you, he wants to save you. And it will not require that all the addresses you don't know in America, all the addresses you don't know in Britain, all the addresses you don't know all over Nigeria, be searching for them before you are born again. My brother, it is not like that. Because you see, this wicked man, where will he start his restitution? Think about it. He will never finish. Oh, but I thank God for his grace. Don't you? Don't you? You know, that grace is available for you. That grace is available for you. You know, you might have been evil. Think about highway robber. And he said, your life or your money. And the man gave all the money. And he said, now... Five minutes, get, your, get into your car and run away. And the man left a 5,000 naira behind and ran away. Now the man comes, he wants to be saved. He didn't even know the facial appearance of that person because that was his business in the day, in the night, everywhere. And now he wants to get saved. What will God tell him? To go and find out all the people he doesn't know? No, my brother. No, my brother. No. Our God is more merciful than that. This God we're serving is a gracious God. I'm praying you meet this God tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. And so you see, he said, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. Listen. Is God trying to make this man blind? Don't think like that. Was this man worried? How will my eyes be opened? Don't think like that. God is a merciful God. It was that light that came. The light was so bright and so sudden. Yes, he just lost his sight. But you know, Saul went and he just abandoned himself into the grace of God. Because we are told 
He saw no man, but he led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did he eat anything nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, here I, here I am. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, what is that? Oh, God is wonderful. He prays. You know, God never gossiped about this man, saying, Behold, he's crying, he's feeling so sorry, he's feeling that he's so wicked. Listen to me. You find somebody who has come to the church, and this person was very bad before, maybe a prostitute, and now comes to the church, and is praying and weeping and crying and saying, Oh God, what am I going to do? Have mercy on me. Now when you go and you talk to another person, don't say, ah, God has caught that woman. I said so. God, ah, God is wonderful. Come and look at her. She is weeping and crying there, wicked woman. Pray. God will forgive you, but you will pray. Real praying. And uh, then you call your friend, go and look at her. She is weeping there, terrible woman. You know, God never said that. God never said that. You know, God never told Ananias, Ananias, be dancing and jubilating. Your great enemy, grand enemy, I have caught him. I have humiliated him. His eyes will see pepper. That salvation, I will save him, but before I save him, he will learn a never to be forgotten lesson. You know, God never said that. I'm saying that this God is a merciful God. And you know, never make fun of a sinner. Never make fun of somebody who is coming to the Lord, no matter what he has done in the past, no matter what she has done in the past. And you know, even yourself, you know, whenever you are sad, whenever you are convicted, whenever you are trembling, you know, the Lord is so merciful upon us that the Lord will tell his own son and the angels in heaven and say, I'm going to show mercy on that person. Behold, he prayed. And you know, Saul was praying. And when uh, Ananias got there, in verse 17, Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands upon on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Brother Saul, so quick, that is the mercy of God. Let me ask you a question now. This man that God converted, pay attention. He comes into the church. How many years will he wait before God will begin to use him? How many years? Saul did not wait a number of years. My brother, think about the grace of God. People come into our church. My brother, Peter waited three and a half years before the day of Pentecost came. All those apostles waited three and a half years before the day of Pentecost came, before they started doing something dynamic totally for the Lord. Saul just came in and the Lord turned his life around and he began to be wonderfully useful. You know what I'm telling you? When you were born again, maybe many years ago, before you ever became a worker, how many years? Three years? Three and a half years? Five years? Now somebody comes into the church now, not even an ordinary sinner. Not even a, a, a moderate sinner. A terrible, terrible, wicked sinner. And now he comes into the church, he's born again. You know what? We don't, we don't even call him a worker. We don't even call him uh, an evangelist. We don't even call him a Sunday school teacher. You know his name? Apostle. Uh-uh, I won't take that. Because I waited and I sweated three and a half years before I became an apostle. That's the grace of God. Don't grumble. Just praise the Lord. 
that this God is a wonderful God. And to know that this God will have mercy upon every one of us, whatever we have done in the past, if we just say, Oh Lord, here I come, here I come. You remember the words of that song? Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, where, there where the blood of the Lamb was pledged, sin and despair, like the sea waves cold, threatening the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Dark is the stain, we cannot hide it. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide, whiter than snow you may be today. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. A wonderful song and a wonderful experience for Saul. He wrote 13 of the books of the 27 books of the New Testament, more than half. And from chapter 9 onwards, you have the mention of Saul, but now the apostle Paul, 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 all the time he was a great sinner. The Lord changed him to become a great apostle. What God has done for him, he can do for every one of us. Rise up and let us pray. God is not angry. God is not angry at you. Whatever you have done, you might feel guilty and feel condemned and feel convicted but you know God loves you and it's drawing you calling you saying come 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 his mercy is available for every one of us his grace is available for every one of us infinite grace much less grace he will forgive if you only come. And he will use you. Make your life beautiful. And you'll become a mighty weapon in the hand of the Lord. Once he has forgiven you. All by grace. All by grace. He loves you. Come to him.